How's it going, Chasta College Humanities Film Studies? It is Monday, first week of February. The weather is pretty nice, not too bad. Um, hope your weekend was good. I grade one of my classes. I got all the papers graded. I'm not halfway through on the other ones, so hopefully by tomorrow I'll have all the papers, essay number one done um look at my comments i've seen, read some really good papers i want to appreciate that and um we're going to keep getting better with the essays now that you have we're into our third week y'all should have the book if you don't um you're going to need it but um the book, they're all, they're both important. This little book, though, How to Write for Movies, I'm going to sign a chapter right now, three chapter one right now. It's going to help you on your, what I'm looking for. This little book is like a handbook to how to write your essays, critically thinking about your essays, not writing a dislike or like review or thumbs up or you, or you don't like black and white or you don't like silent movies. I don't care about any of that. I want to know what you guys are seeing when you watch the movie and if you're understanding the movie and the concept and the theories of filmmaking which is important to understanding the structure of films is really important we should know what a director is a writer a script writer you know what actors are i think um you may think you know what a director is i'm going to have a whole section uh later on this and i'll just break down a lot of that for you um, because you may think you know what a director is, perhaps you don't. Uh, same thing with uh, cinematographer, which we call director of photographies now, how important they are, set designers, costume designers, all of these things are hugely important to going into making a film. And you don't need to be experts on any of that. It just helps you understand what those people, how much work goes into these things, and then nothing's left usually by accident. People aren't uh, walking around in their own street clothes, unless you're making movies like I do. And um, people are lighting the thing and people are filming the thing. And a lot goes into it, the storytelling. Um, what I don't want, and hopefully it'll become clear as we go on further in the class, on the essays, um, I don't need you to tell me if you really liked something or you didn't like it. Um, I really don't care. Uh, we all have different tastes. Some people don't like uh, horror films. I'm one of those. Uh, I teach horror, but I, I, I like psychological horror over uh, slasher horror. Maybe you like slasher horror. That's fine. Uh, we all like different things. Some people love musicals. Musicals are okay. Um, some people loathe, loathe black and white, like a lot of you, I believe. I was raised with black and white. We had a black and white TV until I was almost a teenager. That's what they used to do, real folks. Color TVs when I was a kid were not uh, ready available, and they were very, very expensive. So we grew up with black and white. It didn't bother us, and some of our greatest cinema in history is in black and white. And in a way, that's how I prefer it. Orson Welles, who, who did Citizen Kane, you're going to write about Citizen Kane next week, so get ready for that. Um, he's famously saying uh, black and white is the truth. Uh, and in a way, I believe that's true. When you strip away all the color and all the noise around a story and you reduce it to black and white images, you can get at the truth in a character study pretty good. It's just like black and white photography. Maybe you like that, maybe you don't. But just look at the black and white photos of Ansel Adams of Yosemite, and you'll see why did he shoot in black and white? Beautiful Yosemite. It's all green. It's all blue skies. Well, he didn't want to show that. He looked at Yosemite like a work of art. And he made his photographs to look like it was a work of art. 
Um, is it reality? Who's to say? I mean, just because things are green and red and yellow, does who's to say that that's reality? Honest. Everybody sees something differently. Um, and so in the next five movies you're going to watch, most of them are going to be in black and white, so you got to keep getting used to it. Now, the early films, they didn't have a choice. There was no color film. They started, they started experimenting with color film, but they could not perfect it, and it's very, very, very expensive to do. Uh, it wasn't until later on, and I'm going to get into a little bit of that today, where we started touching on color. It didn't really become the norm, though. Not at all. 40s? Nope. 50s? 50s, yes. Uh, they started coming out with Technicolor and all these other things to compete with television, which was in black and white. Uh, but still, a ton of movies were in black and white. All of television was in black and white. It wasn't really until the 60s where color became the norm. And still, people wanted to make movies in black and white. Mike, uh, Mike Nichols, <coughs> his, his famous movie, his first movie, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, made it in black and white. 1966, folks. <coughs> And it looks so be uh, beautiful in black and white, it's unbelievable that uh, Haskell Wexler, the cinematographer, uh, won the Academy Award for Best best uh, Cinematography in a Movie that year. And it was in black and white, folks, long after color had taken over everything. People still want to film a black and white. This year, uh, if you look at Netflix, there's two or three movies that they made in black and white. One of them was called Mank. Uh, uh, about the guy who wrote, co-wrote Sis and Kane. That's in black and white. Uh, it puts you in a place in time. Uh, does it take you out of reality? Possibly. Is that a bad thing? I mean, all art isn't reality. Um, most art is not reality. It's a depiction of reality. And sometimes black and white depicts reality better than the actual reality we live in with too much color. Uh, anyway, um, black and white is forgiving. So, so on your essays, don't complain to me that it's in black and white or it's silent. Um, I, I know the movies I'm assigning, I'm aware of that. Um, try your best to behave like you're in a movie theater during the time that the movie came out. So if I sign you that movie, Sunrise, uh, you're in a movie theater in 1927. You're watching it. And you're watching it like 1927, not like you're in a time machine from 2021 and comparing it to new cinema because you have no comparison. That was cutting edge cinema. They didn't know. They didn't miss color. They did not miss people talking. They didn't need it. Film was a visual medium, and it really still should be. Television has made it into a talking medium. That's all they do is talk, and that's fine. I love TV, but they talk a lot because they're telling the story instead of showing the story because they don't have time to show the story because usually television shows are half hour, hour long, whatever. Now we have miniseries. Uh, obviously, that's different. We'll talk about that later as we get up there further into the uh, current cinema. But so the stuff I'm looking for in the essay, really look at that little book. It's going to help you a lot to kind of understand when I say, well, instead of saying somebody is great, like, oh, he's a great director. His direction is great. Or the cinematography looks wonderful. I, OK, those adjectives are fine. But what makes it great? Break it down into three or four sentences. Tell me what you think makes it great. That way it lets me know you're critically thinking about what the director does. Saying the, the, um, by saying the um, cinematography is awesome doesn't really tell me anything. Why is it awesome? I need to explain, you need to critically think and analyze why the photography is awesome. Now, here's the thing. These, pa these pa papers need to be three pages minimum. 
A lot of you didn't do that. I took points off for that. Uh, that's an easy thing. Make it three pages. You can make it up to five pages. I don't care. Uh, and if it goes over five pages, that's fine. I'm not being critical about that. But I need three pages. That lets me know that you're working on it and you're putting some thought in on it. You know, just trying to um, get by on one or one and a half or two pages. It's too small. It's not telling me enough about uh, you putting in the work. So I'm going to keep at this until you're all handing these perfect uh, essays where you don't express how everything's awesome or you're bored or it's great. I need to know why you're bored. I need to know why it's great. That's where the critical thinking comes in. And that's what this class is all about, is to look at these films and really analyze them. Now, I know a lot of you. And that's fine. Do some research. Hopefully you're watching the movies and not just getting research off the web and copying that onto your papers. I can usually tell that's uh, the deal. And I'll ask you in the comments, did you watch the movie? I, I don't feel you watched the movie. I could just tell too much of it was looked like researched and didn't come from your actually physically putting your eyes on the movie. I needed to watch these movies. When we were in class, in a real classroom, we used to watch them in the classroom. And uh, you, you were forced to watch them if you showed up at class. And yes, a lot of people just checked out and looked at their cell phones the whole time. That's up to you. But I want you to look at these films, just like if we're in a literature class, I want you to read the literature. Um, if we're in an art class, I want you to look at the paintings. If we're in a science class, you need to do the science. You can't just look everything up online and just get um, researched information and slap that into your essay. That's not what I'm looking for. I'd rather you uh, really put your own words and thoughts into it, not somebody else's, obviously. Um, and there's no right or wrong in this. Uh, just because you don't really know uh, you know what a cinematographer is. You you don't you're not going to be wrong. I'm not going to say you're wrong uh, about that. If it's if you analyze it, it's your academic responsibility to look at it in a critical way and do the best you can in your critical analysis of these films. Like I said, I've graded about forty of the papers and. There's some really excellent papers so far. And I go, wow. Uh, I don't know if because people are listening to me. Hopefully you are. Uh, or you're getting something out of the class. Uh, now that we're third weekend, you need to all have your books. Um, I'm going to sign chapter one in both books right now. Um, I know some of you don't have the story of film. You'll get it. Um, can you pass the class without it? Yes. It will help owning it because it fills in the whole picture. Uh, also, uh, it'll help you write these essays. I'm going to always refer, please read the textbook on how to write about movies. It's, 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 it's key to the success of your essay writing um, gig here at uh, Humanities for spring of 2021. Okay. Um, please number your pages. Don't make me count pages. A lot of you don't put numbers on the pages that I have to go through and count them. Uh, please just put, you know, put page numbers on your page. Please do that. Um, keep up on your, uh, your journals. You're typing them up every week, I hope. And you're not going to upload them until the last week of school, so don't worry about that right now. But you should be prepared to do that. If you wait to the last minute, you're going to be uh, messed up, I feel. Um, if you're just going to think you're going to remember all of it, probably not going to work out. Also, if you miss a class, meaning you didn't see, you didn't hear one of my lectures, you didn't read the chapter, you were sick, you didn't have, I don't need it to know the excuses, just say I missed, missed it. That's all you need to write. Missed it. Missed that day, that week. Hopefully you don't miss too much. Just be honest, okay? Thanks. Um, go over the text. Go over the book. 
I'm going to do another essay. I'll sign it on Wednesday. You'll watch a movie from the 1930s. It'll at least have sound for you guys. Because evidently, you all miss people yakking, that's for sure. See, I don't miss it, <laughs> personally. Uh, but, uh, and there's some very, very clever movies written with a lot of great dialogue in the 30s because they were hiring playwrights. Uh, I'll talk about that on Wednesday um, when I do the next lecture. Uh, what else? Uh, I want you guys to go in a canopy, watch the documentary story of film, which follows the book I want you to read. Uh, the documentary doesn't go into, the, it goes into pretty good detail, but the book goes into more detail. It could cover a lot more. Um, but the documentary gives you a good survey look at the story of film, how I'm approaching it. And that's not how my other, other teachers may approach it. That's different. I'm going at film as the story, and I like that. And actually, it's called an odyssey, which is a journey. It's a journey into cinema as not just a money-making machine, not a celebrity machine, but as an artistic, collective artistic endeavor that is the artistic accomplishment of the collective. And when I say collective, that means the masses, everybody, Everybody goes to the movies, usually. Some people don't. Um, that we've ever had before. That's over 100 years old now. We didn't have it before 1900 or so. Uh, we had other things like literature and painting, and uh, there was photography and uh, and since then, movies has kind of taken over that film. So. And disc uh, on the canopy, it is the, the you'll watch part two. It's uh, the it's called it's the heading is in the 1930s. I'll write this out in um, in the announcements. The great American movie genres and the brilliance of European film. That's the wordy title of it, but it covers the 1930s, which we've been covering for the last day, couple of days. And it goes into some filmmakers um, like John Ford and Alfred Hitchcock. We can't talk about everybody because there's <clears throat> literally not enough time. <clears throat> but it'll be a it, it's a good representation of that what was going on in that decade. This is ramping up to World War II, which we're not there yet, folks. So make sure you go in, if you're having trouble getting in a canopy at the library, you've got to contact me with either a text at 530-941-9661 or my, my email. You should know it by now, rexhaas at yahoo.com. And tell me you're not seeing it, you don't have your library card, and I'll have to ask you to apply for a library card. you got to get into that Canopy if you're going to see this documentary. Yes, you could pay for it, but it's free on Canopy. Uh, I assume you could pay for it online. Just find the episode and pay if you want. If that's what you want to do, that's up to you. Um, so let me know if you're having trouble seeing these things. Um, yeah, so now we're, uh, we're, we're coming out, we've come out of the prohibition, right? We've come, we're coming out of silent films. Sound has changed everything. Uh, now everybody's talking like they can't, you know, like they are inventing language, which they aren't folks. We've been talking a long time before movie camera uh, picked up our voices, or I should say the sound tape recorder. Uh, and it kind of, when it, for Speakies first came in, I told you this last week, it kind of curtailed the visual look of films. They had to make these huge sound stages to make, so everything could be ultimately quiet because they couldn't, uh, record outside anymore because with her traffic and people walking by and uh, so location shooting became kind of a thing of the past and um, everything went into the studios uh, so they could control the sound yes they could control the photography too and some filmmakers like Alfred Hitchcock hated filming outside he'd, on, or on location he'd rather film in the studio and other filmmakers Hated filming in the studios. They love filming out in 
the real deal. Um, even in 1930s America in LA, it was pretty crowded outside. So um, it was pretty noisy. So that's what's happening. And then the camera inability to move very much uh, and the, the sound to, to have portable microphones in the infancy, the camera works pretty static. And so that they could record the sound, it became more important than everything. And it kind of lost um, a lot of the visual beauty of filmmaking. And, and it became to recording actors st stiffly standing by uh, and exchanging witty dialogue. Once the camera equipment got a little smaller and the tape recorders weren't as bulky and the microphones became a little smaller, cameras became quieter, uh, they started, uh, things started getting really exciting. And lots of camera movement and uh, moving about with multiple actors talking. They didn't have to worry about um, recording an actor sitting at a table with a microphone and a flower pot. So I went over the genres of films that were popular in the 30s because of the Depression. People like to escape their woes. I'm going to sign one of those films this week to watch. You'll write about that. It's a kind of a typical, I don't know which ones yet I'll do. It'll probably be a, a screwball comedy of some sort. And um, maybe uh, maybe a monster movie, uh, Frankenstein. Bride of Frankenstein is a wonderful film, folks. Um, have you ever seen any of the... Probably not. The original Frankenstein, well, he's lonely. And so, uh, as you would be, he's he's created Dr. Frankenstein, this monster, and the monster is lonely because he wants a monster girlfriend or a monster wife. And so in the sequel, they make him a wife. And he's very, very excited over that. The monster is, folks. Um, except for she rejects him. Oh, bummer, man. And that's not good. Because after that, he tears down the whole place. He kills everybody. So um, even the monster gets rejected by another monster. That's how brutal that movie is. Uh, it's actually better than the the uh, uh, original. Anyway, maybe I'll sign that. We'll see what happens, uh, how I feel. Which ones I can find. I do try to try to look for stuff that you don't have to pay for. Uh, but because we're not driving out to the school, we're saving gas money, right? Parking meter money, food money. So paying $3 for a movie is just maybe part of the course now. Um, I don't feel so guilty about it as I did the first when I had to sign these and you had to pay for it because I used to bring the films in. You didn't have to pay for anything. Okay. Sorry about that. That's the pandemic. Don't, don't take it out on the staff. Uh, so um, for 10 years, Hollywood knows how to get your money. They're still doing well. It's the depression. Nobody has a job and yet they know how to get your nickels and dimes and get you into the movie theater. And people would watch a movie for two hours, escape their jobless lives, their inability to feed their kids, their inability to pay their rent. It's, does it sound familiar, folks? If anybody's out there in the pandemic, uh, a lot of people cannot pay their rents right now. But they're watching Netflix that crazy. Uh, they're streaming Hulu like crazy, yet they can't feed their own food stamps. That's what we do when we need sort of an escape from the reality of life. And Hollywood knew how to tap into that. Um, now, towards the end of uh, the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt is president, and he comes up with a whole, um, what's called the New Deal, folks. And um, what changed everything was he started putting money into projects that put people back to work. We started building freeways, highways, bridges. In the arts, he gave a ton of money, not a ton, but a bunch of money 
to the arts in New York. And so now we have people like uh, Orson Welles um, and uh, Lee Strasberg and his people creating incredible Broadway plays as being 1935, 36, and there in that era. And they're being supported very minimally, but they're being supported by our taxpayers' money to help because they figured the arts were important, folks. We just don't live by building bridges alone, you know. Uh, and so all of a sudden people were back to work. And so we started, and that created other jobs and it created good feeling. And people were feeling pretty good about themselves. We're ramping up to World War II. Hitler's on the rise, but we're kind of not paying attention to that. We're hoping it's going to go away. It's not, folks. Um, things, we're not going to go around with Japan. We're hoping that's going to go away. It does not, folks. Uh, but, um, but for a few years, it looked like we might come out of this depression with some money in our pockets and more movies to go watch. And so films got more expansive. This you'll see in the documentary I want you to watch on uh, Canopy that, um, for example, towards the end of the uh, decade in 1930s, 1939 would be a good example, there was a plethora of films that changed the course of cinema history all in one year. Uh, just to name a few uh, would be Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, maybe you've heard of those, uh, John Ford's uh, Stagecoach, so many more in Anuchka. Um, I can't, I'm not going to list them all. They're, they're listed out there. Um, if you Wikipedia 1939 films, it was a bumper crop of films like we've never seen before. One after another, groundbreaking, wonderful cinema. And some of it was in color. Gone with the Wind is completely in color. It was literally the Star Wars of its day, folks. People were so enamored of that film. This would be my parents' generation. That was their Star Wars. That was the best movie they'd ever seen. They'd never seen an extravagant, epic movie about the Civil War like that ever before. And uh, based on a best-selling novel. And um, it changed everything. The same year, uh, John Ford directed three movies in one year, folks, uh, all based on uh, historical events in America. Uh, Young Mr. Lincoln with Henry Fonda. This is Abraham Lincoln before he was the president. He did Drums Along the Mohawk, uh, which is uh, set during the uh, Revolutionary War with Henry Fonda, Claudette Colbert. And, um, and then he directed a groundbreaking film that changed Westerns forever called Stagecoach. Um, Stagecoach made John Wayne a star. He had been in movies for a decade, but he mostly be movie um, Westerns, quickies. They weren't highly thought of. John Ford believed in him. Uh, John Wayne, he had put him in, uh, he hired him as a crew member first. Um, and finally, he gave him a starring role in Stagecoach to find him as a star. From then on, he was on his way. Um, and the story was a, what they would call an adult Western. It just wasn't about good and evil. It was about a lot of things. Now, we've seen he kind of established this template of modern uh, movies uh, that we've seen a Hundred many, many times over uh, where they put a group of people all different in um, confining dangerous situation, which in this time was a stagecoach going through uh, Indian country um, in the desert. Uh, they all need to get somewhere, but it's a dangerous crossing and a stagecoach, so there's always this threat. Um, John Wayne plays sort of a young gunfighter out for revenge of his brothers being killed. And um, he's also wanted by the law. And um, the Ringo kid, yeah. Um, in the stagecoach, there is this, the, uh, the pregnant uh, uh, 
school mom type who's all uptight and she's very morally outraged about sharing the stage with Johnny Ringo, the Ringo kid, and he's she's a also in the stagecoach is a gambler, played by John Carradine, and there's a crooked banker who stole a bunch of money, but nobody knows that yet. There's the uptight um, salesman who's selling booze, but folks, he sells liquor. And uh, there's the drunken doctor who's being run out of town because he's, um, well, they don't want him there anymore. He's drunk all the time, and so he cannot be relied on to help people. And then there is the prostitute. But they're running out of town. She's the proverbial uh, prostitute with a heart of gold. And she's immoral. And the founding fathers want her out of the city. Fathers want her out of town. So all these people are on the stagecoach going through this hostile country. And as we get to know each one of them, each of them has their own backstory. And we, who do we admire most out of this? Well, you get to admire... Eventually, the prostitute turns out to be the best person on the stagecoach. Doesn't matter what her her uh, her job she has to do. Uh, Johnny, uh, the Ringo kid, it turns out to be a, you know a really good guy. Also, as does um, others on the on the stage. Now, it was a huge hit. And it was the first time people saw Westerns as a complex adult story, dealing with adult themes of uh, prejudices, class prejudices, um, bigotry, the morality. It covers a lot of ground. And it's shot in Monument Valley, beautiful black and white cinematography. And uh, he made three movies in one year, folks. I mean, this is how they used to do things. I'm going to leave off with this. The studio system was so was like a well-oiled machine. No kidding. So if you're a director like John Ford, he's not creating these. He's not writing the scripts, going out and raising money, casting everything. It's all been done for him. He has very little to do with any of that. He's only there to direct the movie, put the camera somewhere, get the actors in front of the camera, figure out what the scene is, photograph the you know the uh, with a great cinematographer. A lot of times he used James Tolan, um, Greg Tolan, I should say. Um, and then once he's finished with that movie, he's on to the next movie. They are literally building sets for his next movie as he's filming this movie. And then they're building sets from the movie after that somewhere else. And so he is a busy guy. You can, they crank these films out. And they made money. It was a well-oiled machine. And he didn't have a lot of control over uh, budgets or scripts, although he... He rewrote a lot of stuff, and his stamp is on a lot of these things. Alfred Hitchcock was the same way. He was coming into being mostly in the 40s, but he was in England working on some amazing films, 39 Steps, and um, The Lady Vanishes in England until he came to America, and then his career really took off. And... This term came out. They started referring to these guys as auteur directors. Look it up. It's a French word, auteur. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about that a lot during this class. Uh, essentially, it translates to author. Author of your own movie. Well, Hollywood, the studio system, was such a um, booming Product oriented, they they put out hundreds, hundred movies a year, maybe more. Um, there were a bunch of major studios: MGM, Paramount, Warner Brothers. They all put out, and they all each had different genres that they usually went with. 
Uh, Warner Brothers was considered uh, kind of the low budget. They did a lot of gangster films. Humphrey Bogart made his career making a lot of Warner Brothers, what they call B-movies. I'll talk about that later. What's a B-movie? Um, MGM made grand, usually grand musicals. Each one of them had kind of their own um, stamp. And um, that made them stand out from the other studio. And business was booming. Disney had his studio, and they were cranking out uh, mostly right now, it's, it's animation. Uh, Snow White and the Seven Doors came out in the late 30s, folks, and it changed and made a lot of money because he took hand-drawn animation and he made, it wasn't just for children. It was for everybody. And that was unheard of. We'll talk about animation in Disney later. But this is all, this is the furtive ground that was happening during the Depression, ramping up to World War II. So, 1939, bumper crop of brilliant films that were still trying to match to this day with content, adult contract. And when I say adult, I'm not talking about X rated porn, guys. Uh, I'm talking about emotional adult, serious, mature. I should use the word mature, possibly, instead of adult. Um, now, a little bit that you'll hear me complaining about, maybe we're not so adult anymore. Maybe we're not so mature with all the supermen, superheroes, super this, super that. We've, we're kind of dumbing things down again, and I look for mature work. People acting like mature adults. Not kid, not children. Um, fantasy type of children type of stuff. And these movies did. Uh, was there a vase? Was supposed to be a children's movie, but it told it in such a wonderful, almost uh, avant garde manner. And it is kind of avant garde, folks. Dorothy Oz is a pretty weird place. Um, Flying monkeys, witches, come on, trees that throw apples at you, cowardly lion, a tin man. That's pretty surreal stuff. Um, and half of it's filmed in color, which was a revolution at the time. Um, and uh, my bid on Wizard of Oz is, who would want to go back back to Canvas? <laughs> Canvas. Kansas, after, after you've been to Oz. Oz looks so much cooler. Lots of things happening in Oz. Pretty boring in Kansas. Anyway, but she wanted to get home again, and she probably regretted it, having to get married and have kids, and all of a sudden, I should have stayed in Oz. Anyway, there's no place like home, but why can't Oz be home? And on that happy note, folks, enjoy these movies. Don't dread watching this stuff. Don't anticipate your dread don't anticipate how you're going to be bored or dislike something be open-minded it's an education you haven't been on the earth that long to be bored yet there's a whole world out there of literature and art and movies and music and everything else and the more you know the more your world is expanded we're trying to expand your vision of what is cinema. But basically what it is, cinema is everything. And it's everywhere. See you later.